ete nao kaina himi, tena koto, tena koto, tena koto katoa. Haere mai. A very warm welcome to you all um, to this event on ecosystem based management in Aotearoa, New Zealand, a satellite event to the um, Oceans Decade Laboratory, a healthy and resilient ocean. My name is Timothy Thompson. And my name is Natalie Prince. And we're both PhD candidates at the University of Waikato in Tauranga, New Zealand. We're also live here from Tauranga right now, and we'll be your hosts for today. But first, we would like to introduce to you Megan Ranapia, who will start our event with a karakia, a Maori formal greeting and a ritual of ceremony. Thank you, Megan. Kia ora ne. Uh, ka inoi tato. Unuhia, unuhia atura nga korero te wananga. Unuhia te hau tapu o nga aariki. Waka iria e rongo, ka faka maua ki a tina. Haumie, huie, tae ki e. Uh, and what this karakia means is to draw upon the wisdom of our ancestors, to draw upon the mantle of guardians of the natural world and beyond. Within the realm of uh, Rongo Matane, guardian of peace and peaceful endeavour, let us draw together, learn together to benefit all. Let it be so, it is done. And just an explanation for our international audiences, a karakia, as Natalie mentioned, is like a prayer or Māori chant often used for all aspects of life to invoke spiritual guidance and protection. In this case, it is about coming together, uniting over this kaupapa or this topic and drawing on the teachings from our natural and spiritual world. Kia ora. Kia ora, Megan. So we want to use this opportunity today to share some insights with you into the current efforts towards ecosystem-based approaches to managing our coasts and ocean here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. For this, we will showcase the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. But before we start, um, a quick note of housekeeping. So feel free to introduce yourselves with your name and your organization in the chat function. And if you have any questions throughout the event to our presenters, feel free to post the questions into the Q&A function also down here. And um, we will collect the questions for later on in the event and we'll get to them in the panel discussion. You can also upvote questions. So if you find any of the questions particularly interesting, give them a like and then um, we will get to these first. We'll get to these questions first. Um, over the next two hours, you will get an overview of the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge and an introduction to ecosystem-based management in Aotearoa, New Zealand. You will then learn from selected early career researchers about the science that is being done um, within the challenge. Then after a quick five minute break, you'll hear from leading practitioners in the challenge from a diverse background um, about the barriers they have encountered and the, the uh, lessons they have learned along the way. And finally, a panel of researchers uh, theme leaders and regional managers will discuss outcomes of this event and answer questions from the audience. And to start, a brief welcome from the Director of the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge, Dr. Julie Hall. Kirikoto no mai hairi mai. Greetings to you all. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Julie Hall, the Director of the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge here in New Zealand. Sustainable Seas is one of 11 national science challenges that are funded by our government. The topics for each of the challenges were identified after wide consultation with New Zealanders on the key topics that were important to New Zealand over the next 20 years. Each of the challenges are mission-led with a clear objective. They're expected to be a collaborative, bringing the best teams of researchers in New Zealand that are available. And they are expected to have significant impact over and above publication of high quality research. The Sustainable Seas objective is to enhance the utilization of marine resources while providing healthy marine ecosystems for future generations. To achieve this, we are undertaking research to support a move to an ecosystem-based approach to marine management, 
and also to underpin a strong blue economy. We have drawn together interdisciplinary teams of biophysical, social, economic, legal, policy, and very importantly for New Zealand, Mataranga Māori researchers to co-develop with our, res our research projects with our Māori partners and stakeholders. The co-development and co-implementation of our research projects is critical to ensuring a pathway to impact for our research in terms of identifying the topics and the products over and above the publication of our research that will be of use for our end users, our Māori partners and our stakeholders in their day-to-day -day business. Thank you for joining us and I hope you will enjoy this webinar which has been developed by several of our very talented early career researchers. Thank you very much, Julie. Very kind words. So now to set the scene, Professor Dr. Conrad Tildich will give an introduction into ecosystem-based management in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and will provide a high-level overview of the structures and the goals of the challenge. Conrad Tildich is a professor at the University of Waikato and also a theme leader within the challenge. Over to you, Professor. Thanks very much, uh, Tim and Natalie. Um, it's great to be here today and um, nice to see a lot of familiar faces um, online as well. So like I said, I've been tasked with giving you a high level overview of what the challenge is about. And I think it's also important to document a little bit um, the journey on, on how we've got to where we are today. So um, I'll try and do that in a, in a short space of time. So if we think about Aotearoa New Zealand, um, we're blessed with probably the uh, fifth largest EEZ in, in the world. Um, you can see that here in this map, um, New Zealand there, and then also that white line, which marks out the territorial seas to which New Zealand um, has uh, management rights over. So it's a very, very large space. Within the New Hello. Zealand, yeah? Can you share your presentation, please? I oh, save my presentation? Share your screen. I thought I was sharing my screen. Sorry. There oh, we go. Right. How's that? <laughs> Forgot Thank to click you. the button. What a novice mistake. Okay, here we go. So we have a fifth largest EEZ in New Zealand. You can see um, this white line through here documents the territorial seas over which New Zealand um, has governance. And of course, that encompasses a really wide variety of habitats. We're also blessed with 15,000 miles of coastal uh, habitat as well along a very... Uh, rich and diverse coastline. Because of its isolation and up until, uh, up until colonization, relatively low human footprint, New Zealand is still perceived in many parts of the world as this clean, pristine environment. But unfortunately, like many places around the globe, um, we also have noted, even in my lifetime, um, degradation within the coastal marine environment. And you can just see here in these very simple images of what a reef used to look like when I was young, um, diving on the reefs. And in many places around the country, these lush, rich kelp forests have been replaced by kinnebarrens. Now, the causes of that are complex. They involve removal of top predators. There's other stresses within the coastal environment, such as turbidity, uh, restricting the growth zones of these kelps. The diverse and rich soft sediment habitats that used to uh, encompass our coastal marine environments are also under stress. And you can see that here in these photos taken approximately 15 years apart, where there used to be these lush horse mussel beds supporting high biodiversity in these soft sediment habitats to one that is, is relatively barren. So these document these the community groups, iwi, Māori, have been documenting these declines successively over multiple generations. And it's even come out in government reporting where we state our state of our marine environment reporting, which is done every five years, has continued to document the decline. Now, the problem with this, of course, is we're continually documenting this decline, but we're not reaching um, any solutions with this. Now, as in many parts of the world, the marine, uh, marine environment and the coastal environments is very complex biophysically. And we also have multiple effects within these systems. We have effects that occur in the ocean, increasing and expansion aquaculture, extractive industries such as fishing, redesigning of our estuaries, harbours and ports through uh, maintenance dredging channels, oil exploration and the occasional shipwreck that delivers contaminants within our ecosystems. In New Zealand, the geography of New Zealand and our current land use practices 
also mean a lot of the stresses that are in the coastal zone actually originating on land, which increases the complexity. We've had a rapidly increasing um, dairy farm industry, for example. We have some 6 million cows now populating our dairy cows, populating our landscape. And they generate about, each cow generates about the same waste as 50 people. So all this adds stress to our coastal environment and makes managing it just from a biophysical perspective, linking causes and effects and interacting stresses on these ecosystems, particularly difficult. So not if that was a hard enough task. We've also got a global context where we're seeing a warming world and increasingly more acidified world occurring at larger scales. So this complexity of the biophysical environment is probably matched by the complexity of the legislation that is currently met, uh, governs the management of our activities. So do not worry about the detail of this figure. The key points are is there are 15 independent pieces of legislation governing activities in the marine environment and the coastal zone. They operate over different spatial and temporal scales. And this means managing our effects on the marine environment become particularly convoluted. So if we take inshore fisheries or fisheries, for example, that is managed by the Fisheries Act of 1996, and that is but one activity in our marine environment. We have the Resource Management Act, which affects how much discharge we can put into the coastal environment, but these pieces of legislation often don't marry up. So clearly we need a new way of doing. And to um, borrow a phrase from, from uh, Te Aua Māori, the Māori worldview, we need a much more linked up um, linked up in terms of our thinking in both in the biophysical world, but also how we manage. And this is uh, captured by this phrase, ki utaki tai, which basically means from the mountains to the sea. We need to embrace the complexity, embrace the wholeness, and realize that the people are, separate, are part of the system and, and the connections that are occur, occurring across multiple, multiple ecosystems and multiple spatial and temporal, multiple spatial and temporal scales. So of the problems I've described, I think, are common throughout many places in the world. And this is really the nexus or the impetus for the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. So as Julie explained, um, the whole purpose of this challenge is around healthy ecosystems, but also that triple bottom line between healthy ecosystems, healthy people, and healthy economy. And we see this as EBM as a tool that acts as the driver between a new way of doing the marine economy that supports healthy ecosystems, which in turn supports a healthy blue economy. So it's very early work within the challenge was focused on identifying what practices of ecosystem-based management were already occurring across the country. And this little infographic here highlights many different examples occurring at local scales of what EBM or ecosystem-based management might look like. There are some examples where special legislation has been put in place in Fiordland to protect that area where we can have fishing and tourism and healthy ecosystems in that place. In other parts of the country, Rivers have been given human status, recognizing the effect that the health of the river is an integral part to the health of the people. But these systems are occurring at very small localized scales driven mainly by the community groups. So these little small pockets of, of EBM across the country helped us in the early days of the challenge, defining what ecosystem-based management might look like for Aotearoa New Zealand. Of course, many of these principles will be familiar to those of you across the world because some of them have been taken from the international literature, but we've put them into an Aotearoa New Zealand context. And one of the key differences, I think, between New Zealand and many other places in the world is we have a, we're evolving towards a co-governance model that is um, dictated by our underly underlying foundation document, the Treaty of Waitangi, which is an agreement or a document, a piece of legislation, and that looks at protecting and preserving Maori rights and, and responsibilities of management within New Zealand. So this co-governance model is not perfect yet, it's an evolving and moving feast, but it's a key part of the ecosystem-based management. The other key difference perhaps between some of the, um, the sort of other places where ecosystem-based management is being defined is the knowledge base on which it is based. We're moving and evolving towards is how we can use traditional ecological knowledge as a valid, and recognized an equally important source of information. Māori, like many indigenous communities throughout the world, are intergenerational observers of the environment around them. And they have been living in harmony with their environment for long periods of time. 
So being able to bring that knowledge and that understanding into decision making is pretty critical. The other elements about it being tailored and scalable, that humans are part of the ecosystem, they don't sit outside it, has to be adaptable, sustainability for intergenerational and collaborative decision making are all elements that exist in other parts of the world when they start talking about EBM. So our challenge uh, was to basically how do we shift a current, current governance structure that is um, embedded across multiple pieces of legislation, how we've got this complexity of human effects on the environment, how we give voice to Mataranga Māori and Indigenous knowledge systems, how do we begin researching and shifting a management system towards hopefully something that's a little bit more uh, holistic, joined up and connected. So the first phase of the challenge ran from 2015 to 2019. This just gives you an idea of the scale of the first half of the challenge, some $30 million, lots of researchers, lots of organizations, and, and lots of projects. So this, for New Zealand standards, is a very, very large um, program. And an important part of this program has been capacity building across um, and new ways of doing and new ways of thinking. And that'll probably be the legacy of this challenge. And you'll hear a little bit about that from some of our emerging researchers shortly. So in phase one, it is a very much um, kind of how do we start, how do we get moving? So as of course, we ended up thinking and quite siloed in our thinking. We, the, the questions we're trying to answer were predominantly research led. They were multidisciplinary rather than transdisciplinary. So the programs were focused around our C's, which was trying to find better participatory processes to involve wider audiences and more stakeholders in the room making decisions about how we value our seas, not just in terms of economic value, but other values and aspirations for our oceans. We had a program on Tangaroa, which was focused on um, Maori uh, research and Maori ways of doing. The program that I led, Dynamic Seas, which was biophysical science. So this was our, our first phase of our project. And then we moved through in 2019 to 2023, phase two, which we're in here now. And we saw a, a fundamental transition in how we did and how we engaged in the research. There was a huge emphasis on co-development. So we took our learnings from phase one, we took them back out to our communities as stakeholders, central, regional, and local governments, but also the community groups and our iwi partners to look at the questions that were important to them. There was a shift from multidisciplinary uh, uh, research within a effectively disciplined silos to transdisciplinary research where we're trying to bring, bring together both the social, ecological and ind indigenous knowledge systems towards better decision making, which better captures um, what, the, uh, uh, what EBM is all about. There's also a shift in emphasis on what we were producing and trying to generate. So instead of mainly scholarship or research articles for researchers, there's more equal weighting put on good science, but also impact and delivering that through to the people who need it. And that's the whole point of this co-development process. So currently the challenge is structured around understanding degradation and recovery in social ecological systems, having a theme on the blue economy, um, addressing risk and uncertainty in decision-making and enhancing EBM practices. And running across the bottom in a separate program, but feeding into all of these different themes is a much stronger and larger Tangaroa program. Um, and Megan will be talking about her project, which is embedded in that shortly. So we have all this research and we have all these things going on, but the challenge is mission led. And at some point we're actually gonna have to put all our learnings into practice. So now we're currently involved in synthesis, although research is still happening. And the synthesis is about trying to actually take our learnings and our understanding from the research and deliver impact on the ground. So currently we have a number of case studies going on, and this is just an example of one that's occurring in the Hawke's Bay on the east coast of the, of the North Island. There, there's already a group that gets together to help talk through and uh, think about management decisions. And if you can just see with these circles around here, you can see the representation of people around the table in this Hawke's Bay Marine Advisory uh, Council. It includes the governing bodies uh, at national level, Department of Conservation, uh, NZ Fisheries, representation from Hawke's Bay uh, Regional Council, which manage out to 12 nautical miles, the various iwi and hapu are represented, recreational and commercial fishing interests are, are represented, and also um, large industry players within the region is also um, represented. So we've got a case study that we're working on down there, 
trying to better manage stresses within these systems and trialing some of the spatial planning tools that are being developed um, as part of the challenge. So these synthesis projects that have been occurring with different groups throughout the challenge, especially in this latter half, provide some real traction for moving the research through into impact. We also have a, a synthesis, formal synthesis program starting um, later this year um, around these uh, and focused on these different strands. And this is where the, the rubber really hits the road, where we transition from research and co-development into actually trialing and doing with our end users and stakeholders and bringing that research to a point where hopefully we'll end up um, with a roadmap for EDM. And I think that will probably be a bit about, about it from me. Um, just across the bottom there, if you're interested in anything else about the challenge, um, please um, take a look at uh, the, the website. There's an awful lot of information um, on there. Thanks, Nelly and Tim. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Conrad. Um, and with, it, with all of this in mind, let's go and hear from some of um, our research um, early career research is about the research that's being done on the ground. Uh, Megan Ranapia is a PhD student at the University of Waikato, um, and she works at the forefront of stakeholder-driven science, co-developing her research with local communities. Megan, if you want to share your screen. Next time, I'll just share it now. You can see that? Yep. Yes, thank you. Uh, ka nui te mihi ki a koutou, uh, he uri au ngō Ngāti Awa me Waikato Tainui, uh, he kairanga hau moana hau ki te whare wānanga o Waikato, uh, ko Megan Ranapē Toku Ingwa. Uh, greetings to you all. Uh, my tribal affiliations are to Ngāti Awa in the Eastern Bay of Pliny uh, and Waikato Tainui in the Central North Island of Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm a PhD student at the University of Waikato uh, and my name's Megan. Uh, I am here to present an overview uh, of my PhD, which is co-developing and uh, co-implementation of Mātauranga Māori uh, and Western science to address the starfish outbreak and muscle recovery uh, in Ohiwa Harbour, which is located in the eastern Bay of Pliny. Uh, my research is funded by Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge, uh, and it sits within a bigger project known as Afi Mai Afi Atu, Kaitiakitanga based approach to uh, ecosystem based management. Uh, the first part of my presentation, I just want to give uh, some context to the words co develop and co implementation. I'll elaborate briefly on why uh, and how I'm taking this approach uh, in an environmental management setting. Uh, the second part, I want to talk about how Mātauranga Māori or Māori knowledge is underpinning or informing the science that I'm doing for my PhD. And finally, a sort of a brief description on, on what the actual research is that I'll be undertaking. Uh, so my research is interdisciplinary. Um, it is inclusive of Te Ao Māori, marine ecology and environmental policy. Uh, why I believe this is the best approach, there is growing awareness um, and appreciation that multiple ways of knowing and responding to environmental degradation can improve our understandings of uh, social ecological interdependencies, encourage innovation, and most importantly, strengthen trust in dec decision making. So in terms of the how, um, co-development and co-implementation for this research refers to collectively working with our iwi or tribal partners based on their aspirations, their issues, their needs and their priorities for their harbour. Uh, our iwi partners are these lovely gentlemen you can see in images one and two, known as the Ropu Kairangaho, and they are essentially our Mātauranga Māori advisory group. Uh, these kaumātua or elders are not only knowledge holders but practitioners as well. They still actively use and occupy Ohiwa Harbour, uh, so their knowledge is not only intergenerational but is still current. And I feel like this is quite important to highlight because sometimes we view Mātauranga Māori or Indigenous knowledge as something that sits in the past, uh, but it's not. It, it evolves and is still very much alive and practiced today. Uh, we also have support by local district and regional council, uh, and essentially the hope for this research will to inform um, policy or management around starfish and shellfish management for Ohiwa Harbour. 
Um, so code development really starts with having good relationships uh, and, and that, that is what we have with our Komatua. But this is really a testament to my supervisor who has nurtured a strong relationship with our Komatua for over 10 years. Uh, and this is a really key principle in Tao Māori, or Māori worldviews, known as Whakapanaungatanga. And this means not only to build good relationships, but also to maintain them. And having these relationships not only empowers the researcher, but those involved in the research itself. However, to do this does require more attention, time and effort than is often acknowledged in research, but should be considered and built into research methodologies, uh, which is what I've done. Uh, so it helped me sort of navigate or bringing together um, two knowledge systems. Uh, I've created this sort of uh, co-developed framework, which is based on a whakatauki or Māori proverb. And it really speaks of, or refers to the importance of building upon past knowledge, values and principles for achieving Māori aspirations today and into the future. So really for me, it's about seeking knowledge and advice from our elders, our kaumātua that guides and informs the work I do for my PhD. Um, this does mean sharing control of the research objectives, practices, dissemination and outcomes, because often we position the researcher as the expert, but, off, but in Te Ao Māori it's often our elders or kaumātua who are our uh, experts or knowledge holders. Um, so the second part I want to address is how mātauranga Māori uh, is underpinning the science that I do. And to give you an understanding, I sort of want to uh, give you some context or explanation about the history of Ohiwa Harbour. So Ohiwa is located in the Eastern Bay of Pliny of Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's an important mahinga kai or food gathering place for several iwi, including Ngāti Awa, which is one of mine in the west, uh, Tūhoi in the south, and to Upokorehe and Whakatohia in the east. The mussels have sustained many generations uh, and the, the, the act of harvesting and preparing mussels and the management of these shellfish came with a wealth of mātauranga Māori. However, in the mid to late 90s, iwi found that their traditional mussel beds were declining. So arahui, which is a traditional pra management practice that prohibits the take of certain species, uh, coupled with muscle surveillance, surveillance was employed. What they found was to, despite best efforts to protect the muscles, that the numbers continued to decline. Uh, and actually during the monitoring program uh, in around 2009, they found a substantial number of 11 armed starfish. So the, these starfish are native and they are a natural predator to the muscles, um, but in large numbers can have devastating effects. Uh, this image you can actually see was taken in 2019 on a pippy bed, so that's a bivalve shellfish in Ohiwa Harbour. And within that two hectare bed, there was an estimated 100,000 of these starfish. So with this knowledge, iwi and iwi researchers decided to intervene by developing a muscle restoration program. And they've been successful by establishing these mus muscle restoration stations uh, and have deployed these muscle spat lines made out of natural resources and have been successful in recruiting the muscles. But the next phase is now to translocate these muscles to the sea floor. However, the sea stars are still likely to, to hinder these efforts. So I guess this really segues into my research, which is how do we best manage sea stars to encourage recovery of the muscle beds? I guess what I'm trying to, what I'm trying to allude to is that the prior efforts taken by local iwi who have enacted kaitiakitanga, so the practice of managing their environment, and through employing a monitoring program in Arahui, as well as successfully recruiting mussels, meant that their mātauranga, so their knowledge and their actions, have subsequently led to the understanding of the potential drivers of the muscle, muscle bed decline uh, and the research questions being asked. So with all this knowledge, um, and the research questions outlined, the first stage of my research was to collect empirical information. So we um, conducted or recorded uh, current sea star and muscle distribution abundance and population dynamics, as well as other environmental data, which would be put into uh, a habitat suitability model for mussels, um, which is another project that's taking place in Ohiwa. 
and this would give us an idea if starfish and mussels are recruiting uh, and establishing on the bottom and growing and whether the starfish are still hindering our natural mussel recovery. And so with the data we collected, um, we disseminated our results back to the Rōpū Kairangaho and to our council members. So we conducted a hui or a meeting, shared our findings and sought their opinions and advice and based the next phase of the research from their feedback. Uh, essentially, this is how I co-develop my PhD at every level and every stage with our co -martua. Um, what we found was, yes, both sea stars and mussels showed signs of recruitment, with several size, size classes found, and mussels are wanting to establish and grow on the bottom. However, sea stars continue to place predation pressures on the mussels. So with that information, we all agreed in investing in research around um, starfish intervention by removal to see if one, whether it was feasible to remove sea stars and which removal strategy worked best, and two, would removing um, starfish improve muscle recovery? And so these sort of study objectives was um, supported by EWI 100%. So yeah, so really the next stage is to create and execute an experimental study. So we've proposed three starfish removal treatments, one by trapping, um, the other by diver removal, and then the other one is a controlled treatment. And when we clear these areas, we'll actually seed those mussels from the restoration stations and just monitor their survival over time. Uh, and following on from this experiment, we'll also replicate sort of the control treatments throughout the harbour using the habitat suitability model, um, placing mussels in areas where it predicts are really good for mussels and sort of monitor their condition over time. And what this will do is um, one, ground truth the model, but also hopefully locate areas that could act as potential refuge sites from starfish predation. So with all this information and all this work undertaken, we'll then report it back to our Rōpū Kairangaho and to our council members, and then collectively work on recommendations for starfish management for Ohiwa Harbour. Uh, and I'd just like to acknowledge all the wonderful people involved in this project. Kia ora. Kia ora, Megan. Um, yeah, fascinating to, to see. It, it really seems like you're very involved in every single step uh, and also really involved into connecting different knowledge systems, which is absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure we'll get back to you later on in our panel discussion. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Rebecca Gladstone Gallagher, who is a research fellow at the University of Auckland and who has worked with the challenge for a few years already. Rebecca, the floor is yours. Just Thanks, un Natalie. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie and Tim. Uh, hopefully, you can see the, the slide. Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca. I'm, I'm a research fellow from the University of Auckland and um, I'm involved in two Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge projects. And since the theme of this session is a healthy and resilient ocean, I'm gonna focus my talk on uh, managing coastal ecosystems for resilience and recovery. I'm gonna focus broadly on how ecology can feed into decision-making that's focused around this aspiration of a resilient, um, and healthy ocean, and what are the biophysical attributes of coastal systems that are going to affect decision outcomes. Um, the, the kind of theme of today's talk is I'm going to summarize some of the ecological work that we've been doing and how we're conceptually linking that to um, appropriate decision making um, actions that, that are appropriate uh, depending on the e ecological attributes of the system. As Conrad alluded to, the coastal marine environment is subjected to many um, multiple stresses originating both on land and in the sea. Um, we've got land-based stresses like um, the runoff of pollutants into the coastal waters, but we've also got stresses that originate in the sea uh, themselves, such as fishing and mining. And the problem is, is that a combination of often seemingly quite small problems can lead to large ecological shifts from healthy functioning ecosystems like this top photo here of an estuary to um, a degraded non-desirable ecosystem like this um, more muddy environment below. And we call the combined effect of multiple stresses cumulative effects and 
cumulative effects lead to or can lead to unpredictable changes that we call tipping points. Tipping points and cumulative effects uh, complicate environmental management because they're difficult to predict before they happen. And the reason tipping points and cumulative effects are complex to predict is because the effects of stresses on marine ecosystems are not the same everywhere. This is because um, different places have different levels of inbuilt resilience and they have different spatial and temporal dynamics in terms of both the stresses and the ecosystem elements. Um, for example, these two pictures here are, are two different estuaries. One is a uh, quite a nice looking uh, relatively healthy estuary and the other one is a highly degraded estuary that suffers from eutrophication and algal blooms. And um, the point of these two pictures is to illustrate that some estuaries can cope with uh, some level of nutrient input into them and, and they won't necessarily go eutrophic straight away and others are a lot more vulnerable um, a lot more vulnerable to to things like nutrient enrichment and that's because um, they have different levels of inbuilt resilience properties context dependencies like this are a major challenge to deal with because it means that actions in one place or time might not work in another place or time and so we need to make new decision frameworks that are underpinned by ecological science that account for these context dependencies in responses. Um, and so for the remainder of this talk, I'm gonna focus on managing coastal ecosystems for resilience and recovery as a key focus. And I'll summarize some of the biophysical attributes of coastal ecosystems and their key stressor regimes that can inform broadly what type of management approaches are likely to be appropriate in different contexts. And this work that I'm presenting today is um, work that's done by uh, many members of, of the teams that I'm working with, so it's not just um, me. Understanding how ecosystems operate inform us about how the ecosystem is likely to respond to stress. And this here is an interaction network that's built for um, an estuarine ecosystem. And it's built based on uh, decades of ecological research from members of our team and from other people as well. Um, and the key thing to note here is that there are a lot of connections between things like species, like shellfish, um, which are in the pink there, microbially mediated processes, um, like primary production and nutrient cycling, and also environmental properties like sediment characteristics. And this means that when stresses influence the environment or the ecosystem, it means that um, it stresses some of the components in this network, but there are indirect effects on other components. And these indirect effects and the structure of these networks influence how the ecosystem responds to additional stresses. So these networks change with stress. For example, in this picture here, we have a network in a clear estuary, and then we have a network in a relatively turbid estuary, um, which is impacted by sediment runoff. And this picture shows that the stressed network has a lot less connections, and this makes it more vulnerable to other stresses because it isn't functioning to its full capacity. So the structure of these interaction networks are critical um, if we're to understand how ecosystems respond to multiple changes and stresses. Temporal dynamics in coastal systems are a critical property. Um, and temporal dynamics have many dimensions. So you can think about how long a stressor remains in the system. So if we take uh, sediment runoff from the land into the coastal waters as an example, sediment can be delivered to the coastal environment uh, over very short time scales. Um, if we have a huge rain event, we can have a one-off sediment dump into a coastal area with some heavy rain. But then we can also have chronic sedimentation that occurs over years and years and years. And these, these generate different effects and different responses in the ecosystem. But it's not just the duration of the stressor inputs that's important to, uh, for us to incorporate into how we manage estuaries. It's also the legacy it leaves behind. And in some places, sediment can be flushed out to sea relatively quickly. Um, and so if we were to turn off the sediment tap, uh, that ecosystem may not have such a big legacy of that stressor. But on the other hand, we can get chronic buildup of sedimentation in estuaries that leads to the mudification of them. And this can leave a legacy where even if we were to stop all sediment inputs into the system tomorrow, um, there would be a physical legacy of that stressor that can remain for decades um, or indefinitely. And, and these are particularly complex uh, for us to manage. But it's not only the legacy of the physical stressor themselves, but also uh, stresses can leave biological legacies. 
Um, stresses can affect different types of ecological components in that interaction network that I showed you. For example, water column turbidity from uh, sediment runoff from the land, it blocks light to the seabed and, and this can change microbial processes in the sediment that are linked to that network of functioning variables that I showed you. But these microbial processes are relatively fast to change and respond. Um, and so if that turbidity event only lasted a short while, then the ecosystem might not be too vulnerable to a loss of resilience and function. But the problem is, is that stresses can also impact uh, ecosystem elements, such as those key species that underpin the structure of the ecosystem interaction network that I showed you. And these elements, uh, for example, shellfish species can be extremely slow to recover um, and, and they can often take years and, and sometimes they don't recover at all. And this leaves a biological legacy that can be very difficult to return to um, once that stressor is removed from the system. So it's just not only the duration of the stresses themselves, but also the biological legacies they leave behind. And, and a key point is that the physical effects of stresses can be removed by um, management such as limiting stresses, but biological effects can, can remain. So I've spent a bit of time talking about the temporal dynamics of ecological responses, but there's a spatial dimension that's also important. And coastal ecosystems take uh, many shapes and forms from a hydrodynamic perspective, and this can influence the size of areas that are impacted by uh, land-based stresses, for example. Um, in, in an open coast uh, where, there's, where there's lots of physical movement of water, um, stresses can potentially be dispersed and have shorter residence times than, for example, in a barrier enclosed estuary. And this influences the area um, of the coastal environment where a, a stressor effect might occur. But the size of the area affected by stress uh, also influences its ability to recover, where larger areas uh, show much slower recovery than smaller ones. Um, simply because the organisms that are responsible for the recovery have to travel from further. And also, uh, if we have an entire area that's, that's disturbed by something, um, there is minimal areas surrounding it that can help it to recover. So when we're thinking about managing coastal ecosystems for this resilience and recovery, there's many combinations of these spatial and temporal attributes that can influence how easily the ecosystem uh, might recover if we were to reduce stress. Um, and there's many different recovery trajectories. So if we were thinking about uh, stressor responses where we only impact, well, where the stressor only impacted the faster recover elements, so those microbial things that I was talking about, we might see recovery trajectories that look something like this um, if we were to turn that stressor tap off at the catchment. Um, and in this case, a decision to reduce the stressor would probably be good and, and quite sufficient to improve the state of the ecosystem. But if the ecosystem was degraded to a point where these biological legacies existed, then the recovery potential is much less because um, ecosystem elements like shellfish, for example, can take years to recover and sometimes they can't recover because we have things like um, bottlenecks that, that prevent them from recovering. And in these cases, reducing the stressor on the system might be insufficient um, to reach desired outcomes if, if we were trying to uh, manage that ecosystem for recovery. So we can think about how these biophysical attributes and what they mean for ecological risk and how this translates into a need for different types of approaches um, to manage for ecological resilience. And this is a conceptual diagram which shows the kind of temporal scales of the ecological legacies on the y-axis that I was talking about and the x-axis shows the spatial extent of a stress's effect, and the shading in the background shows the level of risk of the ecosystem changing state. And you can see that as the spatial extent of stressor effects and the temporal duration or legacies it leaves behind increases, so does the risk of something bad happening to that ecosystem. But we can also think about what this means for the type of decisions and, and which type of decisions might be the most appropriate depending on the specific responses that we're seeing at, at a particular time. Um, so in situations where we have stressor effects that don't leave legacies um, and they're kind of one-off events that are not chronic, the decision might be that we should just monitor the ecosystem, but that monitoring should be focused on these kind of elements that dictate the resilience of the ecosystem. But given the ecological properties I've discussed, um, if we had a situation where the stressor was chronic, but it was only affecting 
uh, the faster recover processes that I talked about, then the decision might be let's reduce the stressor regimes to that place and let the ecosystem recover. And, and that might be appropriate in those situations. But if we get situations where stresses are affecting large spatial areas um, and they've left significant ecological and physical legacies, then reduce and let recover will be insufficient um, to, to achieve the desired outcome of, of managing for recovery. And we may need to think about doing some active intervention to promote ecological recovery. Um, a key message in this is that there, there can be a mismatch between actions and stages of ecological degradation. And if that happens, then um, the desired aspirations or outcomes uh, may not be successful. So in this talk, I've talked mostly about the ecological attributes of systems, but cumulative effects in, in coastal systems um, are a social ecological issue and, and being slow to act increases the likelihood that actions will be mismatched with the stage of degradation and delaying actions can exacerbate ecological legacies because things often get worse before the actions occurred. And there's a lot of connectivity between the catchment and these receiving aquatic ecosystems. And we need to ensure that there are feedbacks in the management system that focus on urgent actions to reduce these mismatches between action type and ecological degradation. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks Rebecca. I really do marvel at how you, um, how, how well you describe these co complicated concepts um, in a really clear way. So really, really well done um, and really interesting. But now uh, let's hear from Dr. Vera Rollins, um, who just, just completed her PhD at the University of Waikato and very swiftly found a job as a postdoctoral researcher within the challenge. Vera, over to you. Kia ora. Uh, it's such a pleasure to uh, be here with you today and uh, share with you some of the work we've done um, as part of the ecosystem, uh, as part of the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge on ecosystem services, and in particular, I'll focus today on how stresses impact shellfish and the services that they provide. As humans, uh, we heavily rely on the environment around us to provide us with a number of goods and services that we benefit from. These include, for example, the provision of uh, food and fresh water, but also um, protecting our shorelines. And we love going out into nature for cultural and recreational experiences. As an ecologist, my interest lies in what it is that nature does and how that links to the things that people care about through the provision of goods and services that have benefits and values to people. Ecologically speaking, we can look at the mechanisms that um, generate these services by linking uh, environmental processes and functions to services. And in my research, I've used uh, this ecological information to study services that are generated by shellfish. Shellfish provide a number of important ecosystem services um, beyond their provision of food. These can um, be provided through both commercial harvesting and agriculture, as well as uh, cultural and recreational gathering of kind. But shellfish also have other um, important services that we benefit from, like uh, improving water quality, stabilizing shorelines, and providing habitat to other species. In our research, uh, we use um, these ecological mechanisms to study um, the underpinning links uh, between processes and functions to services and see if multiple services were underpinned by, uh, by similar process, processes and functions to help us understand uh, how we can best manage these. When we applied um, this approach, we found that there were four key groups uh, of services or bundles of services, each underpinned by its own sets of mechanisms. This um, resulted in services related to marine resources, coastal health and quality, habitat modification, and biological structuring. Uh, this can help us uh, understand not just how they are formed, but also how we can best manage them as uh, services with similar underpinning mechanisms may be prone or respond similarly to activities and stresses on them. So um, in the next kind of part of our research, we were really interested in looking at um, identifying areas of importance in where shellfish can contribute to services and estuaries, um, creating spatial maps of ecosystem services using this um, ecological information. To this end, we used an ecosystem principle approach that focused on creating very um, 
simplified and generalized representations of the role that bivalves play in uh, providing these ecosystem services. These principles were then linked to uh, shellfish density and environmental data layers to create ecosystem service maps. And these maps will have a number of applications, including um, scenario testing, informing decision making and restoration initiatives. And we can also look at uh, human impacts, which is um, kind of an interest uh, for today's talk. We applied this approach um, in a case study in Tauranga Harbour, which is located on the east coast of the North Island of New Zealand. And we predicted four ecosystem services with two uh, important shellfish. We focus on Ostravenus or um, the New Zealand Coco and Pippis, which is a subtitle clan. So Ostravenus has quite a widespread distribution throughout the harbour, whereas Pippis is very spatially restricted to uh, high density beds at the harbour entrances. And what we found um, is quite different spatial patterns in the service provision by these two species. With Ostravenus um, contributing to all four services in those highest categories, but in different parts of the harbour, meaning that um, it's the density, the high density beds are important, but also the conditions in which they are found. Whereas for pippies, we found quite different patterns with uh, different levels of contribution, where pippies um, contribute less to water quality regulation, but really high amounts to sediment stabilization, which reflects their spatially restricted nature in the harbor. But marine environments are experiencing uh, unprecedented levels of anthropogenic stresses on the environment. Uh, these can come from pollution, eutrophication, overharvesting, but also global warming and sea level rise from climate change. As Conrad and Rebecca have nicely illustrated before, these, um, these stresses don't tend to occur alone. And we often uh, have to think about stresses um, and their cumulative effects. Where we may know the uh, individual effect of some stresses, when multiple stresses co-occur, we may not get um, simple additive responses. In other situations, we may get much more complex stressor interactions that can result in either synergistic or antagonistic effects where we, um, where we have to figure out what the response of the system to those multiple stresses will be. And this can have huge impacts on um, how we manage the environments and the decisions that we make, but also brings along uh, a large amount of risk and uncertainty because we're, we're still working out exactly what these cumulative stressor effects will be. To this end, we um, started with looking at how species will respond to stress by modeling the abundance of a number of estuarine macroinvertebrates, including shellfish to stress from land and climate change using data collected throughout New Zealand. We specifically focus on models with and without pairwise stressor interactions where we can uh, use these to simulate both uh, models with only additive effects and models with both uh, additive and multiplicative effects. This helps us understand how um, our understanding of these cumulative stressor effects improves um, model performance as well as look at changes in abundance along increasing stressor gradients. So what we found is that models with stressor interactions are critical in evaluating cumulative stressor effects as we only found 15% uh, of stressor effects to be additive in our um, example, when we also allowed for these synergistic and antagonistic effects which were dominating. These multiplicative models um, always uh, had higher model performance than their additive counterparts and showed some really interesting patterns in terms of changes along stressor gradients. So for our uh, cockle species, we looked uh, as an example here at how the abundance of the species changes in response to a significant stressor pair. So the effect of uh, mud content as well as uh, maximum sea surface temperature as a proxy for climate change. So what we found um, when we're comparing the predictions uh, for the additive model and the multiplicative model is that we're seeing some commonality. So um, as both stresses increase, there will be a decrease in abundance. But there are some important um, differences where the multiplicative model, which had a better performance, shows some interesting areas of tolerance to stress uh, if either or both stresses are low, so where the, the color remains red. But then we're seeing very steep and very fast gradients of change where we're seeing a sudden drop in abundance uh, if these stresses start increasing, uh, which is in line with a synergistic uh, stressor interaction. These uh, multiplicative effects can also how we uh, manage the environment uh, because 
when uh, we get these rapid changes in abundance of the species that can be, um, be detrimental. So now um, our interest is in combining these two stories. So how are ecosystem services going to, um, to act when under stress? So how are multiple stresses going to impact service supply estuaries, both through um, changes in the abundance of the species that underpins the supply of the services, as well as in, through changes in the environmental conditions, which from our maps we know can really impact where shellfish can contribute to services. We want to use those uh, spatial models to predict where ecosystem services may be gained or lost to hopefully um, get some insight in how we can best manage um, these environments to, uh, to sustainably provide these, the things that we value for, for the future. I would uh, just like to take this moment to thank uh, my supervisors and co-authors and the valuable seas and risk and uncertainty programs um, from the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge for funding this research. And thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you so much, Vera. Um, yeah, also absolutely fascinating, especially seeing how much you can actually find out with modeling um, in addition to field work. So yeah, thank you very much in, in showcasing how we can research into ecosystem services and, and what nature does for us. Um, thank you. Finally, Dr. Eva Shivitska from the University of Auckland. She's a research fellow there will um, be telling us more about her research because she's also leading her own project within the challenge at the moment. But before we will see what her research is all about, a quick introduction from Eva live here. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning to our international audience. Um, so I guess for today, all I'm going to say uh, as a part of my introduction is that I got something unusual ready for you, which is a video showcasing my research, uh, where I talk about all the details about the project that I'm leading, which is uh, the restorative economies, modeling restorative economies, um, using the, the example or the approach from uh, the community-based small-scale restorative actions. So I'll pass it over back to Natalie and Timothy. Um, playing a short video about my project. Hope you're going to enjoy it. Kia ora. My name is Eva and I am a research fellow at Auckland University where I work on developing new ways of managing our oceans here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Today I will talk about my research in a less conventional way but hopefully still as interesting. Hope you're going to enjoy it. Thinking of what's going on in the oceans around the world breaks my heart. We keep on losing so many marine habitats due to ineffective management and economic models that haven't been designed to look after the environment. But it doesn't have to be this way. If you look at the most recent set of global biodiversity targets and see the ones that we haven't achieved, we can observe that the underpinning reason behind not meeting those targets was that we haven't quite managed to properly stop environmental degradation. So we continue to experience the loss of biodiversity, important ecological processes and functions, and nature's contributions to people's well-being. And here is why. The process in which we respond to environmental degradation is restoration. Typically, the story begins with a once thriving ecosystem. Then people arrive. And then we take too much too quickly and the ecosystem starts falling apart. And so does our health, physical and mental well-being and our economies. Restoration projects aim to bring those degraded ecosystems back to life. But the big problem is that ecological restoration has been built to fit within our underperforming business as usual economic model and is targeted to fix few elements of a broken system. This is similar to hoping that one dietary supplement will cure a serious disease while the actual cause of this disease remains present in one's life. Ecosystem restoration needs to be promoted from being a mere supplement to unhealthy economies to being a standalone and large-scale economic movement offering an alternative way of living and doing economy. I think this is the right time and the opportunity for all of us to move forward and as ocean co-partners we should start doing things differently. 
My project looks at how to facilitate such transformative change in the way we approach ecosystem restoration. I focus on small-scale community-based restorative projects. Such local and small-scale restorations are great, as they offer this amazing opportunity for people to reconnect to nature. They raise ocean awareness among the project participants and they strengthen the relationships within local communities. Okay, so what exactly do I do for my project? I work on the development of the decision-making tool that will help local communities in New Zealand choose the right restorative action to begin in their area. This tool will also provide them with a network of support from the scientists, managing agencies, businesses and the government. This decision-making tool will be informed by the Bayesian Belief Network that uses conditional probabilities to determine the likelihood of different social and ecological scenarios. For example, low seawater temperature, low abundance of predators and low water turbidity offer very good ecological conditions for kelp forests to thrive. This is just a simplistic example and you can only imagine how complex and comprehensive these scenarios will get as we start adding more ecological and more social variables. Ultimately, the tool will indicate which restorative actions will have the greatest probability of success in a given area. The final outcome will also identify the next steps and the key points of contact. Thanks to my project, among many other projects on the Sustainable Seas National Challenge, restorations will have a chance to become something more, to become this large and integrated network of projects, stakeholders and co-partners working together towards building the blue economy that prioritizes environmental wealth, looks after their people and enjoys the economic growth, not at the cost, but the gain of the environment. Cool. That was a cool way to show, show, show your research. Yeah. And in general, um, what awesome research that's being done in the, in the challenge. So thank you, thank you all for um, sharing your work with us. And we're really happy to have you, all four of you, on the panel um, with us later for the, for the discussion. Actually, I really feel like having something to drink. Yeah, yeah, that's probably a good idea. Um, let's take a quick five minute break, and then we'll be back here at um, three, 10, 10 minutes past three um, in New Zealand time. We'll put it up on the screen and um, see you there for the second, second part of this event.
Welcome back, everyone. Let us get back at it and straight into it with uh, hearing from leading practitioners of the Sustainable Seas National Science Challenge. So we sat down with four leaders of the challenge themes and asked them to share some of the barriers, but also some of the successes um, in the context to their professional background that they have experienced whilst being part of the challenge. Kia ora kōrua, kia ora tātou. Uri tēnei nō te teirāwhiti nō Ngāti Porau. Ko Sean Awatere Ahau. I'm a researcher with Manaki Whenua Alankia Research. And I'm also the theme leader for the Tangaro research theme within the Sustainable Seas National Research Program. Uh, my area of interest is looking at exploring how mātauranga Māori, Māori ways of knowing can be utilised alongside science in order to be able to achieve shared aspirations for community, particularly for hapu and iwi who are the kaitiaki or the, the guardians of natural resources for their specific areas. Kia ora koutou, um, ko Karen Fisher toko ingoa. My name is Karen Fisher. I'm, uh, I'm an associate professor in the School of Environment at the University of Auckland. Um, I'm a human geographer, so I am interested in um, I guess the social aspects of thinking about the marine environment, thinking about oceans and ecosystem-based management. Um, and it, I, I have a background really, which is uh, freshwater. So I had an interest in freshwater, but again, from the human side of things, like I, I understand very little of the science of um, oceans or of even freshwater systems, but oceans are harder. And um, so I'm really interested in thinking about how it is that um, people interact with uh, I guess the natural environment, how we can put in place different kinds of policies or rules or institutional structures to regulate how we interact with the environment with the goal of ensuring, I guess, for want of a better word, sustainability, so that we're using things sustainably. I'm also Māori, so I think um, that inevitably, especially now, is influencing a lot of the, my thinking and um, a lot of the ways that I'm approaching um, doing my research. And in the sense of thinking about not only the incorporation of indigenous knowledge, but sort of indigenous worldviews more broadly. So what does it what does it mean to be Maori, and what does you know what does the ocean mean for, from an indigenous perspective? So one of the projects that I worked on in um, phase one of the challenge was really interested in how do we manage cumulative effects, and it was very much from the management perspective. And it, you know, spoiler alert, it's really hard. My name is Simon Thrush. I'm the director of the Institute of Marine Science at the University of Auckland. Um, my role in the challenge has been um, a, a long one. I've been there since the uh, beginning of the process um, and trying to help uh, shape the challenge into a new way that we can think about doing science in New Zealand that is relevant but also effective in terms of, of supporting the essential, timely and necessary change in the way that we think about managing our oceans. Kia ora koutou. my name is Elizabeth McPherson and I'm a legal scholar um, based at the University of Canterbury. I'm an associate professor here in environmental and natural resources law and I'm the co-lead of um, the project 4.2 which is law and policy for EBM. I'm one of the few legal researchers involved in the challenge. I teach and research really around the, the, the legal and policy, governance and practice tools that we can design to try and better protect um, the environment and people's relationship with local places. And a lot of my research also focuses on Indigenous and local community relationships with and governance of natural resources in particular marine areas. How we generate the, the, the strength and velocity of change that I think we really need to save our oceans is a, is a major challenge. I would say there are two things we really need to consider here one of them is essentially a social issue and the other is more of an ecological issue. Um, the social issue is that we set the challenge up um, very much 
focused on participatory processes, in particular in the context of, of balancing values and beliefs across society with the role of science in informing decision making. The problem with, with the challenge trying to do it is it's massively time consuming and it requires serious long-term relationship building. And often that's not possible when um, the people you need to build those relationships with, particularly in government, are changing their jobs, changing their roles, and are not necessarily properly in resource to engage you know, this is just another project for them. And it's it's not different or transformational. The science challenge really, I think, is is, is equally profound. Um, pretty much throughout most of my career, what we've been doing is documenting the, the decline of nature um, in the oceans. And it's super important that we understand what's going on and we understand the significance of what's going on. That, that's a given. But the challenge now really is to be thinking about solutions and thinking about transformational change as we get closer and closer to um, environmental claims. And so thinking about that change, again, has us as scientists thinking about um, it's simply not good enough to be doing things that are not focused on um, restoring the systems. It's about solutions, but the solutions are more profound than just, here's another model, here's another tool, you know, here's another tick box. Um, it, it's really about transforming the way we think about managing systems. So again, in New Zealand, a lot of our um, management has, is really focused on limits. We can think of our fisheries management strategy as a limits-based system. You know, you can extract so many tons of a particular species. And we can think about a lot of the ways we deal with land-coast interactions as also limit-based. You know, there are um, standards for contaminants coming off the land and so forth. At a pretty deep level, what those limits do really is they create a race to the bottom. Um, and at a at a more difficult level in terms of thinking about risks to the environment, they tend to narrow down our focus to be dealing with one thing at a time. The problem with doing that is, of course, that we live in a world of cumulative effects, particularly in coastal ecosystems. You know, climate change is just around the corner and, and that's going to give you a cumulative effects problem because in and of itself, there are multiple stresses associated with, with climate change that will affect particularly our coastal oceans. There are a lot of people and um, organizations, institutions involved that, that certainly are very happy with the status quo and don't want to change. Um, and some of them are, are very good at making sure that their voice is heard in the corridors of power. And I think it's the economic system, which is the, the key thing to explore in terms of providing the, the changes in behavior that are required. And you know, if you're looking at the climate change space, there's a lot of pushback in terms of how willing economic operators are in terms of wanting to accept all the externalities. There's all those additional costs that they're placing on uh, consumers, but don't really carry themselves. So that's the, the production of carbon and so on. So until they, until they internalize those costs and become more accountable for it, that I don't think we're really going to get much change in terms of providing incentives for behaviour, moving towards something that's more sustainable and beneficial for the world. Likewise with fishing, I think you need some strong institutional systems or mechanisms beyond the free market approaches that are going to provide uh, guidance for people to, be, to enact more sustainable behaviours. One of the challenges is is to provide the space for not only science and economic interests or information to provide decision makers with useful information, but also in terms of mātauranga Māori. So that's really upon the, um, all parties involved to help support and empower hapu and iwi 
to provide that type of role in terms of providing their knowledge and their aspirations to guide the decision-making processes alongside some of the scientific technocratic data or information that have been produced by scientists and, and other researchers. Mātauranga Māori, local knowledge, local information is informed by the, a long historical connection between people and those ecosystems and that Mātauranga Māori is often derided as being something that's subjective but in fact Mātauranga Māori does have a empirical tradition it's based on a number of years of close observation of the behaviours of species within an ecosystem, but also the interactions between the weather and the tides and all the other factors that go into providing well-being for us from our natural environment. There's a number of examples where Māori have participated in natural resource management processes, have had their voices heard, but then because of political uh, incentives or aspirations from others, decision makers have um, yeah, looked at those power dynamics and have been informed by their decisions. The barriers and obstacles to supporting a, a resilient and healthy marine environment and marine ecosystem and human relationships with those places, I think a lot of the scientists that you're speaking to would talk about these same problems. So fragmentation across regulatory institutions. So we have many different um, institutions within government, but also within communities, industry, um, indigenous peoples, um, Māori, iwi, hapu, and Aotearoa New Zealand, who have a role in managing and protecting and day-to-day -day governance of marine areas and marine resources. And all of those different people and their different perspectives and their different rights and interests do not work together very well traditionally. Um, and our legal system, our laws and our policies that have been trying to protect the ocean, for example, has been a major obstacle and a major barrier to those groups coming together and finding a way to work together for the well-being of the ocean. And it's a historical problem because that's the way that law started to get into managing natural resources. So we had legal frameworks that would deal with freshwater. We had separate legal frameworks that would deal with coastal areas, um, forests in coastal areas, fishing within marine areas, managing environmental effects of mining and other things like that in marine areas. So these were all covered by discrete laws. We have, you know, over a hundred different laws that apply to the marine um, area framed broadly in Aotearoa New Zealand um, and different institutions like different parts of government responsible um, and all talking to different parts of the community and different parts of industry. How you can get all of those processes to be consistent with each other and to take into account you know that the impacts of decision making one of those on the other is an incredibly massive challenge and it's a problem everywhere in the world. And from a legal and policy perspective, which is what our project is looking at, this is something that ecosystem-based management or EBM is trying to respond and adapt to better than our frameworks have in the past. But it's new and it's um, challenging because it will require structural changes within governments and um, the ways in which people are used to working and the, and the people that they're used to talking to in their work um, that will all need to change if we're going to move towards EBM. One of the things that I get a bit concerned about is like in the New Zealand context, it's, I'd, I'd say that a lot of people, a lot of you know government agencies, a lot of industry would all say we want a healthy and resilient ocean. But if you were to ask them, what does that mean? They'd all have slightly different opinions. So I kind of feel, and I think this is where my policy kind of interest comes in. It's like, I feel like we, it's almost like we need to sit down as a nation and figure out what do we want? What does that need? What does that actually mean? And because um, I know, especially in phase one, we were we would run workshops with these very diverse groups of people. And we would, um, my colleague and I would, as we we're planning them, we were like, 
these we've got you know people that basically are opposite ends of the spectrum i mean how are we going to manage this and we realize well actually all they they all agree that they want a sustainable they want sustainability for, and you know sustainable seas we'll just ignore for the moment that they have different understandings of what that means so i i think that's the thing that's missing in some respects is that what do we actually mean by a healthy or resilient ocean or what do we mean by um having a sustainable being sustainable or you know we want ecosystem based management to enable these sorts of things to happen because i, I feel like we don't really know i guess the strength of an e ecosystem based management approach is that it does rely on collaboration it does require you uh, you know being more inclusive of diverse views it requires um a broadening out of the different knowledge that's needed to make decisions about how to manage the environment um the challenge of ecosystem-based management is that it requires collaboration <laughs> and um i think yeah uh and that takes time and that's not easy and um and i and i think in that regard it's probably nothing new in, in saying that, but at the same time, I think it, it warrants being said, the importance of collaboration, the importance of inclusion. I guess what I'm also interested in, and I'm sympathetic about is, um, I, I've, I've heard a lot of scientists saying, we've got the science, how do we get it into policy? But I've seen the science policy gap happening before my eyes, where the, what the policy people need is very different to what the scientists are able to provide. You know, that, So there's that miscommunication and I guess I sit there thinking, I know that there's a miscommunication. I don't know how to help you, but but I think um, it's it is the language. It's finding and and I, I guess it's the different pace at which things work. When you're thinking about science wanting to inform policy, the policy making process and like the legal process is so slow. Making laws is a very slow process. It takes years, sometimes decades, to pass laws and to get them put through Parliament. And, and you know, they're subject to lots of political influence in the process that can sometimes undermine, you know, the scientific objectives. And so trying to create management and governance processes that are adaptable that can adapt to changing circumstances with unexpected things that come up as a result of climate change for example or or um, you know tipping points around land use change in in estuaries for example and I think one of the major challenges one of the barriers and the obstacles to a more healthy ocean is actually getting governance processes laws and policies that are fast enough that can adapt quickly enough to the changes that are happening and be responsive be be resilient be um, constantly adapting themselves so that's a real challenge for law because law yeah has been this very kind of static process you know if you think okay we want to design laws and policies that are based around ecosystems let's do that let's write it in the objectives of the law let's pass the law and then we'll be sussed you know we'll be fine but actually that that's not going to work because ebm is not a, an end point that we have to arrive at it's a constant process it's going to have to continue to change and adapt as the goalposts keep shifting we're going to need to keep shifting with it. So I think that um, the challenge around uh, change and the rate of change and how our regulators and our marine managers can respond to that, I think that's another big problem. And then I think for law and policy scale is a, is a real challenge. If there are some really big unanswered questions around at what scale should we be managing ecosystems and what scale what juris what we call what jurisdictional scale so which part of government is best placed to be managing a particular part of the marine environment is it is it a local um hapu iwi is it the local government the regional government national government international bodies like and that's going to change depending on the place and the circumstances if we want to have management processes governance arrangements, laws and policies that are actually fit for purpose, that actually protect marine environments and, and that are adaptable to the challenges of things like climate change, we need to be getting that information, that data needs to be accessed and provided. Um, I think for too long it's been an excuse that we don't have the information 
to maybe not do things that are protective of marine environments, but I think um, we need to be trying harder there. I think in terms of, you know, what I would encourage my research group to be doing is, is thinking seriously about how they communicate the research to multiple audiences. That in itself is no, no trivial task. But, but also what I would really, really try and emphasize to them is they have a responsibility to do really good, rigorous research, because if they don't do that, then um, the information that they're generating is unlikely to affect change. And so whatever happens in the political world and the social world that um, we don't really have that much control over, at least what we've been doing is filling the knowledge reservoir with, with sound information that somebody at some time can dip into and use. And maybe that's our most important contribution in all of this. The role of science is to support those um, transformational transitions to the approach that's more sustainable. So science will provide, oh, these are the types of fishing methods or these are the types of um, behaviours that need to be changed in order to achieve that overarching goal. And then even science is required in order to determine what that overarching goal needs to look like. Increasingly with co-management co-governance arrangements being implemented in now legislative and policy arenas, especially over estuaries and the marine environment. What we're seeing is the increasingly the sharing of power between central government agencies, local government and Hapu and Iwi. I think the challenge has been really good in terms of providing the information on how do you move or transition towards that uh, goal of ecosystem-based management? So the, the mechanisms are there, good data and information is there to help provide those different pathways or changes in behavior that are required. The issue I think now is providing the, um, the engagement with helping people to transition towards those more sustainable practices. So that's more of a science communication type of approach. Mm -hmm. And it really needs uh, the building of capability with respect to the, the decision makers in that space, whether they're governors, whether they're politicians, or whether they're business leaders within the sector. I think the, the challenge has done a really good job of trying to really support interdisciplinarity and, and transdisciplinarity. A really core and important feature of working in these kinds of collaborative arrangements is I trust my colleagues, so I don't know anything about, um, I, I can't even pretend to know anything scientific, but I trust that my colleagues do, and then we'll, it, we'll communicate to each other in a way that we can understand. Um, key words would be humility, when you're dealing with people that you don't necessarily we well, speak different languages and that could be actual different languages or different sort of disciplinary languages and respect. But I think one of the lessons that's come from the challenge has been um, we need a different form of governance and, and institutional structure to facilitate those sorts of engagement. Um, because at the moment, everyone's overworked and too damn busy and that just doesn't work. By governance, I mean, you know, what a local um, community group or an iwi may choose to do in their particular place, their bay, their harbour, um, right through to what's happening um, on the international stage, you know, at the UN kind of level. Um, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of words at the moment about various kinds of policies and things that are going on. Um, some of that will hopefully translate into action but but globally we're we're good at talking but we're not so good at doing and so that needs to change internationally i think we need to keep each other honest a bit more than we do um, and we need to prioritize more actions around our oceans than we've we've historically seen um, and we need to be thinking of our oceans as you know a, a major opportunity for constructive connections and for um, solutions 
to the problems that we face. We've decided that we actually need to accept that there will be a large degree of fragmentation. And so in other parts of the world at times, they've tried to create sort of one-stop shop, um, you know, one oceans institution, one oceans department and government, and then try and sort of subsume everything within that. And it actually hasn't really worked. And so our research is increasingly focusing on the processes, the governance processes that need to be devised to um, bring all of these different parties together. Law and policy for EBM needs to be underpinned by both hooks and anchors. And by that, by anchors, we mean high level overarching vision or values um, that can transcend different siloed legal frameworks that put the health and the well-being of the ocean and the well-being of people connected to the ocean first. But then the hooks are the rules and the processes and the institutions that might perhaps be in different parts of government or different parts of the community. Um, they're the tools and the mechanisms that are used to better protect the ocean, but they need to be aligned to each other and they need to be underpinned by, you know, they need to be held together by this overarching anchor. What is the vision that we have for a healthy ocean? Um, so at the moment, we're looking into what anchors and hooks might look like for um, a healthy and resilient ocean in Aotearoa, New Zealand. You can already see evidence within our legal system that I find really promising. So, you know, there is the treaty settlements in relation to a number of different places where there's legal personhood and, and that's very different to the kinds of legislation that we've had in the past. And, but the fact that Māori concepts and Māori language and Māori values is making its way increasingly into our legislation kind of means that there has to be a little bit of a shift or a reorientation um, amongst those people who are giving effect to that legislation. But I also recognise that um, a lot of iwi groups or hapu groups are already doing things. So, you know, and not just them, like even sort of at the catchment or community level rather, there's already a lot of work that's being done. But I, I kind of feel like if you've got this overarching framework that is far more inclusive, has different values and different worldviews encapsulated within it, and then we've got this formal framework, then that's a way of kind of amplifying the work that's being done by people outside of that framework. In my lifetime, there have been huge changes in terms of like the legislation. And, and I see that legislation is more of a, I guess, a reflection of society's norms and values rather than just, you know, this is what you have to do. So yeah, I find hope in that because it just, it's almost like a formalization of where we're shifting in New Zealand in terms of the recognition being given to Mataranga in particular. The change is underway at the moment in Aotearoa and I think we need to continue that momentum towards one of partnership, participation and equity following on from a, a wakatauru model where we have uh, Mataranga Māori in one waka and then in another waka we have Western science. And then when we have a shared goal, like improving the health and the well-being of the marine environment, then we need to bring those two knowledge systems together in order to achieve that more holistic goal, that overall well-being goal for the benefit of everyone. I would like to see that the research sector supports Indigenous people to be able to implement solutions that is based on their own knowledge and is aligned to their values and ethics that will be of benefit for not only their, their own tribes, there, but also for the benefit of future generations and the well-being of, of everyone, all the communities who have benefits or derive their well-being from the oceans. I, I guess it's around the ecosystem-based management approach, and they're not really talking about the end goal, but you know, there's it's sort of saying, well, through an ecosystem-based management approach, we can, um, we can still have fisheries, we can still have multi-use, and um, but we can also make some um, progress towards how we manage cumulative effects. And we can also make some progress towards thinking about what do we need to know and what do we need to do to, um, to en enable recovery in, in certain areas and things like that. We can look at our legislation and think, where are the gaps or where are the things that we might be able to tweak 
um, so that we can ensure that we are, you know, there's, I guess, beneficial outcomes across the board. But also the, the, the fact that we have got, um, you know, legal scholars working alongside, social scientists working alongside ecologists. I think that helps in trying to sort of figure, figure your way through the puzzle. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't be so bold as to say we've got the answers, but I think it's trying to figure out um, the solution. And I actually think it's, a, it's not one solution. There's lots of little solutions and maybe some bigger solutions that are needed. Um, and I think that we're working towards. We are training the next generation of scientists to think very differently. And I think anyway, and um, you know, so it's kind of like investing in future, um, future minds the most promising attempts to align law and policy frameworks towards EBM have been approaches that are what we think of as relational. They have a focus on relationships between the different people and communities who care about the well-being of marine environments and between those people and marine places um, and so through the sustainable seas projects we're trying to kind of practice living those values around meaningful collaboration um, because if we can't do it within a research project then how is government supposed to do that in its day-to-day -day governance it's all about standing on a bridge between what you're used to doing and you know where you need to go and the problem is that everybody needs to get on the bridge and we all need to be going in the same direction. And that means that it isn't something which is just about the scientists need to do this. Um, equally important is that the, the management agencies, um, the relevant industries, they all have to, you know, they all have to buy in and work towards that. If we're going to take this kind of blue economy stuff seriously, it's not economics, business as usual, but about the ocean. Well, inspirational, um, inspirational words and lots for us to think about, really. Um, yes, good for Time to wake up. <laughs> um, all right, now um, that we've gone through the the, the biggest part of the, um, of, of the of the event with all the presentations, we want to um, invite Conrad, Megan, Becca, um, Rebecca, Vera, and Eva back to the virtual stage. Uh, but before we get into the questions that we've gotten from the audience, which are some great ones in the Q and A's here, um, we would like to introduce three additional panelists to our session. Dr. Joanne Ellis, who's a senior lecturer at the University of Waikato, who leads a co-leads co a project within the challenge on communicating risk and uncertainty, and also leads the program on scale and ecosystem-based management. Dr. Phil Ross also a senior researcher at the University of Waikato, who now co-leads a project on blue economy within the challenge. And Dr. Hannah Jones, who worked at the Re Waikato Regional Council after graduating with a PhD from University of Waikato, and now works at the Ministry for the Environment. Welcome, the three of you. Um, thanks for being here and, and joining our panel. Um, and to give you all, all three of you a chance to uh, introduce yourselves um, first, before we get to all these interesting questions, um, I've got just a couple of uh, yeah, little little questions for, for each of you. Um, let's start with you, Joanne. Um, yeah, maybe you can just quickly give a brief introduction to yourself. But then also, we have heard of scale quite a lot uh, today as a major issue. And scale has been named as an issue that is emerging also within the challenge. So what are the considerations for EVM on scale dependencies? Yora, thank you, Natalie and Tim. Uh, my name's Joanne Ellis, and as they've introduced, I'm part of the Sustainable Seas Challenge, leading two projects. I'm delighted to be here. My background is that I'm a marine scientist, and I work on benthic systems. 
So the question around scale is actually a really interesting one. We've heard from many of the researchers today that scale is a key consideration in terms of thinking about more holistic or ecosystem-based management processes. And this is because uh, EBM is a dynamic process. It's focused on understanding and managing ecosystems across a range of organizational. So we're from iwi, hapu, up to regional or local council level through to national level. Temporal scales, so past, present, as well as future considerations such as climate change. And also um, finally thinking about yeah, th those spatial scales of local, regional and national. But how scale dependency um, is dealt with is different in each and every discipline. And this is something that many people have touched on. How the interactions between these dif different disciplines occurs is also scale dependent. So we're in the very last phase of the challenge are gonna be looking at some of these scale dependencies um, by working with existing challenge leaders and our co-development partners to specifically identify where these scale dependencies occur between say legal policy, cultural and ecological systems, and trying to identify where they align, where they're, where they're aligned and where there are mismatches. And the aim of this is to try and contribute to making scale transparent in decision-making. Nai mihi. That sounds great. And yeah, as, um, as we've heard recently, I think that's also a new trajectory that the, the challenge is going towards with the new project. So uh, quite exciting times. Um, Phil, can you give us a quick introduction uh, about yourself? We have a, quite a few questions for you, but we might keep them for a bit later on. And just click the unmute quickly. <laughs> Thank you. Another rookie error. Um, kia, ora, kia ora, everyone. I'm Phil Ross. I'm a marine ecologist, as you've heard. I guess my contribution to sustainable seas and the blue economy is to become an aspiring clam farmer. So I, I work, um, work up in, the, in Northland in the far north um, with a number of, number of different iwi and hapu, particularly um, in, this, in this project it is Te Rorua, um, and they, their rohe includes Rapira Beach, which was the, the, cent, the center of the universe when it comes to these big giant surf clams, the tohe roa. So these things were were um, harvested to the to just about the point of extinction, um, and after forty years of being protected, they haven't recovered. And so, um, this project that I'm working on, um, funded by Sustainable Seas, um, is is um, on one on one hand looking at how trying to understand why they haven't haven't come back from um, that the classic example of how not to manage a, a fishery. Um, so that's part of it, and then the other part is looking at whether we can set up um, tohiroa aquaculture as a way of um, that will be owned and owned and run by the, the iwi and hapu in Northland, and it can provide um, wealth and jobs and opportunities in a, in a remote part of New Zealand where those things are pretty hard to come by. So um, yeah, happy to talk about any of that as we go on. Kia ora. Awesome. Yeah, hopefully that inspires some more questions to come in. But yeah, we we also have a couple for you later. And then uh, Hannah, thanks for being here. I think you you might get some of the big chunks now. Um, yeah, feel free to also give a quick introduction about yourself. Um, and our question for the beginning would be from the perspective of management. Um, what are the difficulties of integrating ecosystem based approaches into a regional and then also into a national level. Um, do, you, do you want me to answer that now? There's, there's no way I could answer that in its entirety and, um, and, in, and quickly. Um, that's a really massive, complicated question. But my Tim did a great job of introducing me, so I won't bang on about it. My background is as a marine ecologist, and I've mostly worked as a government scientist. Um, at regional council and now at Ministry for the Environment. So um, working in a team involved in resource management reform and setting environmental limits and targets. So from the point of view of kind of thinking about ecosystem-based management, the challenge is obviously really timely and really needed. And we've heard heaps about um, 
why we need ecosystem based management and why it would be useful, but there are plenty of challenges um, kind of implementing it in our uh, country and I think in general anyway. Um, I, th I think lots of the reasons have already been touched on in people's presentations, which is really awesome. Um, the kind of political and economic drivers are really important. I saw Kath Wallace put a, a question up about that and it's absolutely a massive, massive um, part of um, trying to work out how to implement EBM in the kind of economic landscape that we have. Um, but some of the challenges that I've personally come, come up against are, are probably um, the fact that our current resource management system sort of assesses effects on a case by case basis. So you really do end up with death by a thousand cuts and there are very few examples of adaptive management, um, but that but it is getting more, um, I guess, doable and kind of something that people are starting to think about and implement as best they can. Um, so I, I think the challenge is really, really helpful in trying to guide some of the principles behind that. Yeah, awesome, thank you. I think, as you say, this is a massive, um, it's, it's, it's a massive question, it's a massive issue, and uh, maybe this can kind of like also be the theme of the, the discussion in a way, because as you also said, um, Kath Wallace has posted in the, in the Q&As here, and that's something that I wanna um, just, it's a bit more of a comment. Um, she said, some attention to econ economic and political system drivers is needed. That means looking at the pressure put on decision makers by the fishing industry, heavyweights on ministers and officials, the way they influence what is, what is and is not researched, how they design systems to suit their interests, and how the officials don't stand up to them, but instead recruit from the fishing, mining, or other extractive industries. And um, I think this is a good comment, and it's, it's also something that... Um, we wanted to ask in terms of um, some of the statements that came from the interviews that you just heard and that um, from our leading practitioners where Sean and Simon say that um, we really need a, a change in the system, right? Whereas Elizabeth McPherson says that there are quite a lot of um, policies and governmental um, things in place that we don't have to all throw away and we don't have to discard everything that we've already built on. So maybe I wanted to... Um, Ask the, that question to to our, all of you, our panelists. Maybe um, maybe starting with Conrad um, up there. Uh, do you think that our system needs to change, or can we readjust the existing frameworks to make it fit better? Um, I, I think Elizabeth gave you the answer in, in part. Like Simon and Sean are, are thinking far into the future. Elizabeth is is working from the perspective of the here and now, and um, she made a comment about how long um, legislation takes to put in place and then how there's vested interests in keeping it in the status quo after that. So legislative change is, is long and hard um, unless there's a, a pandemic and then things can move quickly. But as we've noticed with, with the environment, um, things tend to move slowly. We can just look at the action on climate change as an example of that. So, so I guess my answer would be sitting on the fence, both. Um, the here and now, um, there's plenty of ins into to implementing EBM or EBM-like and the principles that we've talked about into current management strategy. And we can take the 1996 Fisheries Act when they start talking about ecosystem-based management as a basis for fisheries management. The problem is the terms and our understanding of ecosystem-based management has evolved. So what that looks like now in terms of a much more holistic, multi-user, multi-stressor um, effect and what needs to go in to manage that is completely different from the interpretation of what that would have looked like 20 odd years ago. And so whether or not the act stays as it is, we reinterpret the language and actually implement it within the existing structure is one way forward. And that is possible. Although as Kath's pointed out, there's plenty of inertia within the system that would stop that or whether we just need to throw it all away and start again. And either of those two, the latter will take longer time. So we've got to start in the here and now, I guess, and also work on that, what would be revolutionary change, I guess. 
Yeah. Um, is there anyone else who would like to add to this comment? Yeah, yeah. can I just speak? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I can. I think I can add something. I, I agree with Conrad totally. Um, and one of the cool things that I think it might have been Simon said was that part of the transformational change is around um, sort of everyone agreeing that that we need to focus on restoration. So if our kind of activities in the ocean are undertaken with a mindset of restoration rather than extraction, um, which we can do under current legislation, um, then well, I think it would all be in a lot better state in 10 years time. It's not necessarily something that would need to, you know, take decades and generations away from actually be, you know, improving things a lot, but just having more emphasis placed on restoration um, would be really helpful. And if I can contribute to that as well, so agreeing with the previous speakers, I think that um, such cultural change that we require, as Hannah has outlined here, that we need that sort of cultural change in the way we approach um, just doing things with that restoration in mind. I think that different areas of our lives already experience such um, you know, so, so social change of values, uh, even regarding, you know, producing the plastic waste, that people just become more and more aware of that. And even, you know, the general public, you can see how everyone is trying to be more environmentally aware and friendly. So I think if we can just invest all that potential that we have that emerges already in a different, or like in some different areas of science and implement it too, you know, Kind of approaching doing economy with that mindset that okay let's do it differently let's do it in a way that we don't destroy and exploit but we look after the environment in the first place i think that there's those um linkages or those dots that we just have to connect and i really hope that some amazing things will start happening after that i guess uh i guess change change is hard um, but, you know, we've seen over the last couple of years some fantastic examples where I guess the, you know, Māori communities around the country have effectively forced, um, you know, changes in the way we, we fish areas. And so we've got these great examples with um, Rahui on scallops off Hahe and Rahui around Waiheke Island and there's a new one in Taranaki. And so, um, I know there's a lot, a lot of resist, resistance to those, but they are happening. And you know, I think that's a, a different way of looking at doing things and hopefully it works. Um, yeah, I think, I think that, um, that kind of like, maybe, maybe we can get Megan to speak about this a little bit because she's um, on, on the ground as well um, in doing the research with the local communities and um, you, you come from a perspective of a, of a um, I guess having learnt the western way of science and but then you also work with with the elders who are the knowledge holders of, of that system and um, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on your your journey there and balancing balancing these two things and if um, you know what the understandings are of these two different systems of each other yeah, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, like you've alluded to, it's really about yeah trying to um, have that balance. Um, it, the journey has been somewhat tricky, but really enlightening. Um, you know, from a personal level, it's been really meaningful. Where um, you know the bringing together of Mātauranga Māori and science um, can provide you know more innovative ideas and, and practices and, and management approaches but the challenge is that it's still a relatively new space you know and for emerging researchers such as myself um, it has been quite tricky because uh, there aren't a lot of examples where indigenous knowledge has really set precedent for the research and hasn't really been explicitly written or published and so that can make it really tricky um, but I think going forward it's about um, having really good support around you. And I'm quite fortunate. I've got really good supervisors um, who are well-versed in their disciplines, but are open to 
new approaches and I think for yeah emerging researchers that's really important to have to have that support in terms of yeah bringing in indigenous knowledge and in and Māori I think Sean alluded to it before about it's really as a researcher it's about providing space and opportunity for those Māori communities to step in and bring their knowledge um, and really what what it is that they want to be carried out um, when dealing with environmental degradation and that so yeah yeah, that yeah sounds sounds really really awesome. Um, big fan. <laughs> um, maybe quickly, Phil. Again, if you could um, just add to this, you have a different experience, and you come from also from like the other side as a Western scientist working alongside communities. Um, can you talk a little bit about your experience and also um, how you think that local engagement can lead to a more flourishing blue economy? Another another big question. So um, yeah, I guess I've you know to tell tell the full story of my experience would be here for like two days. But I guess like I think one of the main challenges for um, you know academic scientists um, to engage with the Maori world and with Matauranga Maori is that we just haven't haven't um, come through university with an understanding of what it even is. And so my, my kind of first interactions with Māori communities were, were terrible. I, I um, did, made so many, so many mistakes and upset so many people. And then I had to kind of step away and figure out, you know, what I'd done wrong and realize that, you know, my approach was, you know, it was terrible. Went away, figured, figured a few things out, um, talked to some people who, who provided some some guidance as to how, um, what good interactions look like. Went back, built, uh, rebuilt some of those bridges that I'd, I'd burned and now have, you know, excellent, excellent relationships with a number of iwi and hapu around the country with whom I'm doing research. Um, you know, I guess my example would be working on, working on the Tohiroa. There are, you know, clearly have discovered that a lot of the, um, I guess, as scientists, the things that we knew to be true um, were wrong, and you know the, the local experts were the people who knew they were wrong were able to, and were able to show me that. So that was some really classic examples of how um, you know this different different people have different different uh, sets of knowledge. And then I guess with this with this aquaculture project, it's really seeing how um, as a scientist, you know. I can provide some scientific knowledge, but it's the community that has their aspirations and their vision for what their future is going to look like. And you know, my job is to you know provide the science that's going to you know help them achieve what they want to achieve. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, it really seems like um, something that's that's crystallizing out of all of these discussions, but also out of what we've heard before, is that the communication of these issues, and not only the communication of um, between different stakeholders and between um, governments and, and, and scientists, but also in a, in a way the, the flow of the information is really, really, really important and a critical step in all of this. Do you agree? Yeah, com communication is absolutely key. And if we can't, uh, if we, yeah, if we can't talk to each other, then we're certainly not moving forward. Yeah, let's let's keep uh, communication as a keyword. Um, so we have one question from Ines, um, which was for Rebecca um, and answered in the in the Q and A already. But for our listeners, also, when or how do we know or define the shift from one-off event of stress to chronic stress? And I, I assume once the stress becomes chronic, you will immediately create biological legacies within the system. That's what Ines asked, and so I would. Um, like to give the word to Rebecca um, to maybe just give a, a brief summary of her answer to this question, but then also maybe um, to Rebecca um, and Vera and, and Joanne, how would you, um, yeah, how is communication of the science that is sometimes quite complicated, um, how is that a key aspect of uh, moving forward with regards to um, sustainably managing our environment, uh, coastal environments? Thank you, Rebecca. Thanks, Natalie. Just to answer um, Ines's question, 
Um, so basically, I, I don't think we can assume that all chronic stresses will create a, a biological legacy because um, we can have different properties of stresses and, and the types of um, components that they that they affect in that interaction network. So for example, water column turbidity can be quite a chronic stressor, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to impact uh, key slow growing species that leave these biological legacies. So it's kind of context dependent and we need to develop principles that are based on the, um, the properties of the stresses, but also the responses that they generate so that we can uh, more generally assess the kind of risk of different stressor regimes to to different place-based ecosystems. Um, so that's to answer the question. And can you elaborate a bit more on um, how you experienced science communication to be key for the work you've done in the past? Oh yeah, also Joe and, and Vera or anyone really can, can jump in. I'm yeah, I'll be to... <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, um, I was just going to say, I think there's a, a few elements in terms of the communication. One is that uh, obviously this, the science communication needs to be very clear about uh, the ecology and from that the risks, because Rebecca's touched on things being context dependency, how many cumulative stresses there are, how healthy is the system to begin with or moving towards a degraded or a tipping point. So that ecology needs to be very clear. The uncertainties around that also need to be transparently communicated. But alongside that, um, Sean Awatere acknowledged that there are these two waka, he introduced the concept of the two waka, the Western science and the Motoranga Māori knowledge. And what I found in the past is that often the knowledge systems are complementary around environmental degradation. And when you get both worldviews coming together closely, it tends to have a, bit, um, a more strong effect in terms of influencing positive outcomes for the environment and hence people. So. Just to elaborate a little bit on uh, Joe's comments around communicating risk and uncertainty, uh, as part of our research uh, where we focus on stressor effects on species, we uh, were interested in um, kind of going beyond uh, saying this is an additive antagonistic or synergistic effect and visualize what those stressor effects may look like along uh, increasing stressor gradients. Now, an additional part of that um, was also looking at, uh, from, a, from a model or certainty perspective, um, how certain are we about those predictions and um, how can we communicate that information? Because um, what we found is that when we included these cumulative um, stressor interactions, we saw that um, the uncertainty uh, from our models actually was, was higher. So we thought we'd get, we'd get a better uh, model performance, but we're getting more uncertainty, which is a really uh, important point because it was actually a much more honest reflection of the uncertainty that existed from within um, the data that we had available. And that is really important for, from kind of a risk assessment point of view, because when you want to start managing for multiple stresses, um, it's really important to know and communicate um, how certain we are about these, uh, these stressor effects. Uh, and that links into some of the work uh, we've done in the risk and uncertainty program, um, where a lot of uh, uncertainty in, from um, co-development partners in, the, in our project comes from imperfect data, but links to other types of uncertainty they're experiencing as well. And, um, uncertainty related to delayed responses, um, making decisions without perfect uh, information and knowledge is, is an important part of that. Yeah, and I guess that's a, <clears throat> I guess that's a really hard thing to communicate to people as well. <laughs> um, here's a here's a comment in the in the Q and A from Sonny Whitelaw. Um, Ecosystems are contested spaces. I work in the area of braided rivers, and the impetus is to protect millions of dollars of infrastructure from flooding under a changing climate regime. People won't care about braided river ecosystems when they believe higher levees and reducing braid, braid plain, which to control rivers is the only valid priority to save their homes and business. You are no doubt seeing the same contested response on coastlines. And um, I would like to open this up maybe to like uh, more general thinking again. Um, 
to see it, do we um, is is there a like what what type of change of behavior um, is required from the general public I guess and how do we as I guess people who are passionate about this um, how, how do we achieve this this uh, change of behavior that is needed to kind of like move towards that sort of understanding of people um, of the of of their natural environment as being really important. Does anyone have a <laughs> something they want to say to this? I'll, I'll have a go at this. Um, I think, you know, we've got, we're in a biodiversity crisis. We're in a climate crisis. We've got to start living better with nature rather than trying to control it and, and shape it into things that are not really um, good for the planet and good for people. And I think, you know, we are seeing that shift, or I'm, I'm getting old now. So I'm seeing that shift in thinking already in the young emerging scientists that we have here today um, and also in the school kids that I go out and speak to, they are passionate about this kind of change. I don't think it's going to happen quickly. It's going to be a combination of top down, i.e. through trying to shift legislation and policy um, and how that's enacted. But it's also going to be bottom up as well because people have votes and they can do things. And I think, you know, this overriding sense that livelihoods and economies and drive is the only thing that is involved in decision making and has shifted towards a more holistic evaluation of the biodiversity, other values for the system um, has, has to happen. And I think the biggest challenge within the challenge is we can only take this so far. Um, you know, we can do our research, we can talk to people about what we're doing and communicate these ideas. And that's why communication is so important. But we don't write the bills, we don't control all of these other things and I think um, yeah it's going to take a, coming into this system at multiple levels to affect that change but if we're not talking to people then change isn't going to happen anyone else want to add something to that Maybe I can add something from uh, myself and um, I guess like this is the way how I would like to see like all these dynamic things that are just happening and the way we try to reimagine different things that it's not just the need, it's not just that we have to, but every change offers a range of different opportunities. So I guess approaching um, doing things differently with um, optimism and trying to find things that, um, you know, as Conrad has said, like a lot of youth is passionate about uh, trying to find solutions to be more efficient uh, and just over, overall better for own health and also the environment's health and, you know, trying to find different ways of doing things differently. Like that mindset of just trying to find those opportunities and seeing those opportunities in every change that we can, we can do. I think that this is a power, very powerful way of um, approaching this rather than just thinking that we've got to do something because otherwise we're all going to die. <laughs> Thanks, Eva. Did you want to add something to that, Hannah? Or? Uh, uh, really just around, um, comes back to Kath's comment again around economic drivers for a lot of these types of, I guess, kind of legacy infrastructure issues, um, which is something we get on the coast with sea walls that continually need to be rebuilt or extended and no real kind of alternative for that road or for those houses. Um, and there is, you know, a growing acceptance that mandatory retreat is a thing that will have to happen. And it is slowly being written into policy and legislation, but we can't really expect, I guess, that to happen quickly because it's people's sort of um, essentially their livelihoods and their lives that we're asking them to shift and the social costs aren't equally borne. Um, so it's I guess what what I quite what I really like about the challenge is that there has been this kind of um, collaboration between scientists and policymakers and social scientists and economists and lawmakers and it's a uh, or lawyers, and it's, uh, it's, I think, really important for everyone to kind of understand a little bit of um, each of those disciplines, because it starts to make sense why we're in such a pickle, and then 
people have an appreciation of how difficult it will be to get out of it. Um, but there are clearly some ways forward and um, that's, you know, potentially where we should focus. Yes, yeah, definitely. Um, we are uh, already past the two hour mark, but it's just too interesting to stop. So there's only one more question that I would like to ask um, in general, and then we're going to come towards the close of the event. Um, it's a big one, so uh, put your seatbelt on. Um, what do you think will will EBM, uh, so ecosystem based management, be possible for Aotearoa New Zealand, as in to be realized as a system uh, and implemented properly? Um, I guess, yeah, that, that shifting, these shifting goalposts will be able to constantly adapt. Um, and then, furthermore, um, do you think that? Aotearoa New Zealand could be some sort of mesocosm experiment for, let's say, our international, um, yeah, international uh, nations um, and different countries on the planet. It's just, yeah, just your, your thoughts on it. Maybe we'll start with Joe. <laughs> That's a really nice question. Um, I think. The, the lessons and the, the practices of what works will be completely transferable to other places in terms of the lessons from the challenge. And I think there's a lot of lessons that are coming out of the challenge in terms of how you do co-development, um, how you uh, integrate across different disciplines, multidisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity, and some of the lessons, not just in terms of the ecology, how do we deal with cumulative effects or tripping points through to link, how do we link these complex social and economic problems? Um, so I think the lessons are very transferable and I'm gonna pass it over to Conrad because I can see he's got some itching to contribute. <laughs> Um, I, I've sort of um, thinking about this in terms of the lifetime of the challenge, which is 10 years. And I, I think we're not going to wake up one day and say we're doing EBM, right? It's going to be just a way of doing that is transformationally different from the way we're doing things today. It'll be incremental. We'll start off by doing it little bits and places. We're seeing the bright spots of a more holistic approach to management all over the country now. Um, Phil discussed about some of those, how local communities are taking control by placing rahui in areas to help recovery. And I think, you know, if we can get through this transformational change, we're not going to, it's not a destination where we arrive at a place and go, yes, we're doing it. It's a system that will be continually involving and changing and adapting to, uh, the, you know, the current things that we're trying to do. But hopefully, it's a journey that will end up in the reverse. And I think Karen had a really nice slide um, that just showed the decline of ecosystems versus something that was bottoming up and, and things that were improving. So um, yeah, I, I'm optimistic because you have to be like Eva. And, um, and I think, you know, if we start thinking about this, start having these conversations, then we will get on this journey. And there are some, you know, really good markers already on the road for that journey. Um, not just from what we've the research that we've done in the challenge, but from people getting outside and trying to do it do it in a better way than we're doing it currently. Thank you. Very strong words. Um, if anyone wants to add something to that, feel free. And if not, then we can we can definitely be with there. So this brings us towards the end of our event. Um, we would like to uh, acknowledge everyone who has been part of the, this, this event. Um, I would also like to share one more slide just to make sure that everyone um, is on. Oops, sorry, the next one. Where is it? This one. Everyone is on it one more time. So thanks to everyone who's participated in this event today. Um, also for anyone in the audience, in the international audience, on the national audience, um, feel free to, to contact any of those amazing people on this list here. Um, you can just email us and we will forward everything that you uh, want to ask as well. Um, yeah, now mihi to everyone. Um, we are quite excited about uh, this uh, kokapa, this this topic and discussion, because I think within the last couple of weeks we've learned incredibly much. Um, it's almost like writing an essay, but more exciting, I think. Um, 
also thank you for everyone around the world who, is, who has joined us today, but also, of course, um, watch this recording now because it will be recorded and we'll put it up online uh, for the future. Um, we're also very excited to be able to share uh, the, yeah, basically the condensed version of this event today at tomorrow's wrap up event. Um, it's the wrap up for the laboratory on healthy and Brazilian oceans um, from 4 p.m in the Central European time zone, but it's 4 a.m. in New Zealand, so we'll be a bit puffy-eyed, but that's okay, we'll, we'll wake up for it. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for being here, for listening in, and we would like to close this uh, session with Begin and the closing karakia. Nga mihi, kia ora. Kia ora, Natalie. Kia tau, kia tātua katoa, te atapai o te tātua reiki a ihu kraiti. Me te aroha o te atua, me te whiwhinga tahitanga ki te wairua tapu, ake, 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 amene. Kia ora.